This equation is the foundation of quantum theory, but it has a mathematical flaw that's actually pretty easy to understand. This flaw has a very large effect on quantum mechanics, which is currently being used to engineer quantum computers. So why is the quantum flaw a big deal? Well, first, it unifies the dual physics models that we have today. Classical physics, which describes large objects like people and planets. And then we have quantum physics, which describes the physics of the microscopic world, like subatomic particles. And when you understand the idea of the quantum flaw, then you can get rid of classic and quantum and just have physics that describes the entire world. It also clarifies the weird quantum mechanics descriptions that you may have heard of, like wave-particle duality, state superposition, and quantum entanglement. These are all things that basically go away once we understand how the quantum flaw affects quantum mechanics. And today, the quantum computer engineer believes that those are natural states and the quantum flaw will help show that things like state superposition and entanglement are not natural states of how the microscopic world works. All right, what I want to try to do is make this understandable to anybody that was interested in clicking the link. I'm going to start by using basic overviews of all the topics and try to explain all the technical terms and hopefully keep this at basically a high school level. And then I'm going to show all my sources. So if you want to investigate further, you'll have that. And this is what we're going to cover. Uh, this stretches over about a 50 year period of time, but when we're done, we'll have an idea, a really good idea of how this quantum flaw affects all of quantum mechanics. Okay, so the problem is that this equation right here is hard-coded to one second. Now, what is this equation? So, this equation basically started the idea of quantum theory. And it is considered now the equation of the energy of a photon, and a photon being uh, the quantum of light or a particle of light. And you're going to see it in a couple of forms. This is, uh, the original form was E equals H in what we would say V, but it's actually the uh, lowercase Greek letter of nu. Or nowadays you might see it as E equals HF, which is F in this case, frequency. And they both mean the same thing. Uh, if you're not familiar with math, that's all right. I'm, I'm going to try to explain all of these things. And, and you can see here, a lot of the math symbols are either Greek uppercase or lowercase. And in, in this particular case, V is new. To continue with more definitions, the E in this equation stands for energy. For such a common word, it's really not that easy for me to describe exactly what energy is. Um, I just basically think of it as what's needed to make things move. H is Planck's constant. I know it's pronounced Planck, but my accent, uh, I've always said Planck, so <laughs> we'll, have to, we'll have to deal with that. Planck's constant really becomes the star of the show uh, once you get done beating down this equation and uh, figuring out its flaws. This is really what quantum means. So what does the H stand for in Planck's constant? And I've read that it means auxiliary or helper in German. And why would it mean that? It's because when he created this constant, he had no idea what it really meant. This is an English to German translation of auxiliary and helper. Again, it's interesting because Planck did not know what this constant meant and it ends up being the star of the show.
and we'll be going further into how H came about. And then we have the frequency of light. So that's either V, which stands for vibrations, uh, F, frequency, these are the same things, undulations, oscillations, waves, uh, that's all in the same category of frequency. And then we have light, which means the visible light that we see, but it also means the entire electromagnetic spectrum. So if we go into what physics would call the high energy part of the spectrum, then we're talking about x-rays and gamma rays, and we know now that those can be dangerous to us. And then if we go toward what physics would call lower energy light, then we're talking about uh, microwaves and radio waves. This is a common picture of the electromagnetic spectrum and so when I say light we're talking about all of this not just the visible portion but the entire spectrum. And if you check Wikipedia you'll see that this equation is known by a few different names and it also explains that a photon is a type of elementary particle and the photon energy of this equation uh, is the energy carried by a single photon and we're going to prove that to be incorrect when you understand the quantum flaw. Frequency. So this is the one that locks this equation into a one second equation. Frequency is defined as cycles per second. And when you look at per second, that pretty much defines that you need to wait for one second of time for all the cycles to come through. All of the waves or all of the oscillations. And a more familiar term we use for frequency today is megahertz and gigahertz. And these are used to describe our electronics that we use today, like our phones or computers or Wi-Fi routers. And we generally relate it to some kind of a, a speed. So megahertz stands for million cycles per second, and gigahertz stands for billion cycles per second. This is an example of frequency. What I have here is a metronome and it's set to 240 beats per minute, which translates to four beats per second. Four beats per second being analogous to four cycles per second, which is four hertz. So you can see that it takes one second of time in order to get all four cycles for this four hertz frequency. I'll do that again. So you can see that if you're using a hertz frequency in an equation that it takes one full second worth of time in order to get all of the cycles to come through. Now what I'm going to do is only allow a half second worth of time to elapse. You get two cycles. Now this is still a 4 hertz frequency, but what I'm doing is changing the time to a half a second and we're only going to get two cycles. Now why is this important? Because if you do not have a time variable right here, then you're locking yourself into that one second. If you have a time variable that says, okay, I can put in one half a second, well, that makes sense because now the energy value here is based on this one second and then you're dividing it by two, which makes it a half a second. Let's bring out the metronome again, and now we can pull together everything that is on this slide. 
we'll put H right here. And then V is the frequency represented by our 4 hertz sample here. Each one of these is an oscillation. So what HV is telling us is that H gets added to each oscillation in the cycle. Or another way to put it is H is multiplied by the number of cycles of the particular frequency. Now I still haven't told you what H is, but right now just think of it as a number. Let me redraw H right here. And now we're going to do a 4 hertz cycle, but we're going to stop it at a half a second. And you're only going to get H twice. So to represent this case mathematically, We have H multiplied by V, which is 4 hertz, and you have to add a time variable. And what the time variable allows us to do is to put the 1 half second into the equation. So then we would read this as H times V, which is four of these H's. And then you multiply one half, which is the same as dividing by two. And that brings us back to the two cycles of this one half second example. So you can see when you add this time variable, it basically unlocks this equation from being stuck at one second. But that time variable is not there. It's missing. So this equation is stuck at one second or hard-coded to one second. Okay. At this point, you should be getting a sense that, yeah, something doesn't seem right here. Because if the energy of a photon or the quantum particle of light is based on one second's worth of time, that seems weird. And we can measure the speed of light, which is 300 million meters per second, or 300,000 kilometers per second, or 186,000 miles per second. So what this is saying, if the energy of a photon takes one second, then it's also 300 million meters long, which is basically the distance from the Earth to the moon. Now, that just doesn't seem right. So at this point, I'm hoping that you see what I'm talking about here. But I'm also hoping that you're skeptical. Right, Because you should be thinking something like, this seems too obvious, and why wouldn't uh, our genius scientists have already figured this out over the last 120 years? And I think that skepticism is perfectly normal at this point. So we're going to keep hammering against this equation, because there's more to learn here. And now we're going to see that this equation is unbalanced. The purpose of a math equation is to show that this side is equal to that side. And if you look at this equation and just look at the letters, E does not equal HV. So how do you know that this equation is true. How do you know that this equation is actually mathematically balanced? One way to do that in mathematics is to use a process called dimensional analysis or unit analysis. Let's do a quick overview of unit analysis or dimensional analysis. 
And so Wikipedia, if you type in unit analysis, it'll redirect you to dimensional analysis. So what this does is take these symbols that we have in the equation and it substitutes in the actual units of measure that we use, like seconds or meters or kilograms. Using E as an example for energy, dimensional analysis turns the kilograms into M for mass. For meters, it turns into an L, and for seconds, it turns it into a T. My personal preference is that this is an extra step that isn't needed. And if we look up energy, and you can see the SI base units of kilogram, meters, and seconds. That is the way I prefer to do the analysis, using the units, the SI base units, versus changing them into dimensions. So if we look at the units associated with the variables in this equation, you'll see we have the energy unit, which is a joule. Planck's constant has a unit of joule second, and frequency, as we now know, has a unit of per second, or hertz. So then we just substitute these units into the equation. So we have for energy, joule. For Planck's constant, joule second. Now I put this above a 1 just to make it more symmetric with the frequency unit. Now we can just do basic algebra to simplify the units, and we'll cancel out the second. The ones will basically disappear, and you get joule equals joule. So you can see that E equals HV because when we do the unit analysis, we get joule equals joule, or all the units match and balance on each side of the equal sign. Typically, this is how you're going to see unit analysis done on this equation. But obviously, since the title here says unbalanced equation, then something else must be wrong. So we have to go back to the frequency unit and realize that hertz is really not 1 over second. It's cycles over seconds, or cycles per second. We've already learned about that part of the quantum flaw. So when we substitute in cycles per second for hertz, we get a different answer. So we can cancel out the seconds, or you can write it a similar way, which would be breaking the cycles out and putting per second there. But either way, you get the same answer. And that is, joule does not equal joule cycles. We're left with the cycles term in the Hertz unit. But mathematics does not do it that way. If you compare frequency of cycles per second to speed as meters per second, let's do a quick analogy here. So you would cross out the seconds, simple algebra, and get joule meters. We would not throw away the meters in this instance. So why do we throw away the cycles? The one second flaw in this equation not only broke our idea of a photon, but it also broke math. We should not be throwing away the cycles term because it is physical information. So I think you can see that there's, there's definitely a problem here with E equals HV. 
And I encourage you not to just believe this information. So you could potentially test this on your own. If you know someone that's good at math or interested in science, you can take this problem to them. And most likely, if they do dimensional analysis on the energy of a photon equation, it's going to probably end up looking like this. But then you can question them about the cycles term. And maybe the answer will be, well, we don't do it that way. Then you could say, well, what if you put in meters per second in place of cycles per second? Why wouldn't you just throw away the meters? So why do we throw away cycles? That action causes us to believe that E equals HV is a balanced equation when in reality it is not. Okay, so let's review the last 20 minutes of the problem in about 30 seconds. So on Wikipedia, we can read that frequency is the number of occurrences of a repeating event or cycle per unit of time. And the common symbols are F, V, the unit of measure is in hertz, and the base unit is second to the negative one power, which is another way of writing one over seconds. Now, when we look at hertz, you can see that it is defined as cycles per one second, and it is written as one over second instead of cycles per one second. And you understand the problem that we are throwing away the cycles. And you understand the problem if cycles per one second is in an equation without another time variable, then you're locking the equation into one second time frame. So this is what we're going to do now. I'm hoping that by this point, you can see both problems with the frequency term in this equation. But right now, we haven't really talked about H. So before we get to correcting the problems with the frequency term and understanding the true meaning of this, we need to talk about H. About H, we've got to go back to 1901 and 1905 and look at the works of Max Planck and Albert Einstein. At that point, we should be able to understand how H came about and the importance of H and this equation in terms of quantum theory. Max Planck won a Nobel Prize by solving the black body radiation problem. Let's do a quick overview of what this black body radiation problem is. I'm going to use a FET simulation from Colorado University. The black body radiation problem is to try to figure out the relationship between the temperature of an object and the amount of energy that is radiated outward from that object. So when we turn up the temperature over here to let's say this light bulb, which would be the heating of a small tungsten wire, you can see over here that this curve starts to move upward. And if we keep heating up the temperature to, let's say, the temperature of our sun, you can see that the energy underneath this curve keeps growing. They were trying to create mathematical formulas that would describe this curve based on the experimental data that they were receiving from these black body radiation devices. And from 1860 to 1900, the technologies kept improving to take better measurements 
and some formulas were working in certain ways and failing in other ways. And this is what Max Planck did. He was able to create a mathematical formula that fit this curve, which was created by the experimental data. And there are a lot of good resources that go into much more detail about this problem. And it's actually a pretty fascinating problem that science was able to solve. Now let's look at the paper from Max Planck that got him the Nobel Prize. This is from archive.org and is an English translation of the original 1901 paper. If we scroll down to page 6, you'll see... This is the debut of HV. The energy element, and this is a lowercase epsilon, must be proportional to the frequency of V. So the question might be, since we now know that HV is one second's worth of energy, and Max Planck uses HV in his formulas that solve the black body radiation curve that we just saw in the previous FET simulation, why is the one second energy of HV working in this situation? To answer that, we have to look at the actual experimental data. So HV worked in this case because the data sampled for the black body radiation curve was one second's worth of data. And when we look back here at Max Planck's paper, we can see at the numerical value section of his paper that he takes the universal constants and turns them into numerical values. Now we haven't talked about K yet, but it's known as the Boltzmann's constant and we'll talk about it a little bit more later. But the interesting thing is that Max Planck found both H, which is now known as Planck's constant, and K, which is known as Boltzmann's constant, in this paper. That's, that's pretty amazing. So this is where he's taking the black body radiation measurement data and plugging it into the equation. So let's read this sentence that describes the data. The total energy radiating into the air from one centimeter square of black body at temperature T in Celsius in one second. So that is showing that when they sampled this data, it's one second's worth of data. And it's in the form of watts. So let's look at what a watt is. So a watt is a unit of power, and it is one joule per second. Again, we have something that's very similar to the unit of frequency, which was hertz. Here we have a unit of power, which is watts, and it's joule, or that energy, per second. Very similar to what we learned about cycles per second. Now you can see the watt is a per second value, and then something interesting happens right here. So these units must equal these units. Now this is important, so we have to see how you get from watts per centimeter squared to erg per centimeter squared second. If we have watt per centimeter square, we can take this word watt and substitute in erg per second. Now what's an erg? An erg is another measurement unit of energy and it was used prior to what we use now which is joule. So then we have to simplify this, and we can use algebrarules.com to help us. So when you have this fraction up here, then you'll end up with this, which is erg over centimeter squared second. Now I'm highlighting the second here in red because the data, watts per centimeter squared, is actually one second's worth of data from the experiment, and that is what Max Planck's equations are fit to. Now we can scroll through this section and go to the end and see the actual value 
of h. And if you look at the units, you can still see that there's this lingering second. And since h has units of energy and time, this is known as the quantum of action. Later, we're going to look at this a little closer and see that that's a big deal. We're going to find that there's a mistake in the units for H. And that is actually going to change everything. So to summarize, you can see that the black body radiation experiment collected data in units of energy per second or watts. HV worked in these equations because it is also a per second equation. Interestingly, H was not something that anyone was looking for. Max Planck has a quote uh, saying that it was an act of despair because he needed to figure out a mathematical solution at all costs. So at first it was thought that maybe this is just a mathematical trick. But what it's saying is that nature has a discrete, discontinuous, or a point-like quality to it. And it just can't be divided into smaller pieces. This was not a very popular idea at the time. But regardless, H started the quantum theory of nature. And one person that took this idea seriously was Albert Einstein. And in 1905, he proposed the idea of light quanta, or what we call today the photon. So if we learned that the outgoing radiated light energy was quantized, then the next question might be what happens to that light energy when it gets absorbed or when it's incoming? This is the paper that Albert Einstein wrote in 1905 one of the papers he wrote in 1905 and it's from his collection at Princeton University. This is the paper that he won the Nobel Prize for. Well, it wasn't just for this but it's called out specifically and we'll be looking in detail at the law of the photoelectric effect because he used HV in this equation. The basic idea of the paper is that the wave theory of light does a good job at describing nature in certain aspects. But learning from the black body radiation results, maybe it's best to look at light as particles. This might help us describe things like the photoelectric effect, which the classical wave theory of light does not describe properly. So this sets up a new round of wave-particle duality for light. We'll go to the section of this paper that describes the photoelectric effect, but there you won't see the equation HV. I have to take a little bit of time to decipher the equation that's there. So section 8 of this paper describes the photoelectric effect. But as you can see, this is not HV. So I'll show you how this turns into HV. First we have to figure out what Rn is. In the first section of this paper we find Rn. R is the universal gas constant. N is now known as the Avogadro's number. To figure out what this means we need to go look back at another Max Planck paper. This is Max Planck's paper that he published just before the one we looked at earlier. On page 6, you'll see right here is Avogadro's number. If you fit that into this equation, you'll find that R over N is actually equal to K, which is Boltzmann's constant. So back to the photoelectric equation, we need to figure out what beta is. So in section 2 of Einstein's paper, beta is equal to this number. We have to go back to Planck's 1901 paper to see that h over k is equal to this number. 
And that is what beta is in Albert Einstein's paper. So if Rn is equal to K, or the Boltzmann's constant, and beta is equal to H over the Boltzmann's constant, then the Ks cancel out and you're just left with HV. Now why did he do this? I don't know. So what is the photoelectric effect? A simple definition would be something like this. You shine an ultraviolet light onto a metal, like zinc, and electrons will leave that metal. And here's a quick visual of the photoelectric effect. Ultraviolet light will shine down on this zinc plate, and electrons will be ejected over to the detector. Now we can go to the next page of Albert Einstein's paper and look at the photoelectric effect equation. We now know that this is equal to H, but what is P? This is now known as the work function. The idea is that an electron will need some amount of energy to reach the surface and be ejected from the surface of the metal. The idea of the work function came from Owen Richardson, who was working on thermionic emission. In both cases, you have electrons leaving the metal, but thermionic is by means of heating up that metal, while photoelectric does not use heat. Thermionic emission is how our old televisions used to work with the CRTs or electron guns. You heat up a wire like tungsten to a very hot temperature and it creates electrons that you can direct toward the screen. On page two, he describes the idea of the work function. Work done by a corpuscle, which was the original name for the electron, in passing through the surface layer and escaping from the metal surface. One thing to note is that the work function is really a concept or an idea. We don't have a mathematical formula that can predict the ejection of an electron. We do have a table of energy values that we plug in for this work function. And those values are based on experimental data. Okay. So this is the sentence that describes the photon. The entire energy of the light quantum. And the energy of the light quantum, this is HV from Max Planck's black body radiation paper. We also know that experiment was based on one second data and this formula is a one second formula. So the energy of this photon is one second's worth of energy. But we know that it does not take one second's worth of time for the photoelectric effect to occur. When we shine ultraviolet light on the metal, the effect happens immediately. So now you can see the problem with the equation for the photoelectric effect and the overall equation for the energy of a photon. But at this point, we have a second example of quantum theory explaining natural phenomenon. This was another step in terms of physics splitting between a classical view versus the new or modern quantum view. But if I'm suggesting that all of this stuff is wrong, then what is the right answer? And for that, we will look at a unified view of light using E equals HV. The first thing we have to answer is, what is H? Let's try some new calculations based upon this chart. So this is a chart of the visual spectrum of light. We have the frequencies of the visible spectrum in terahertz. So if you take a single oscillation of light and you measure the distance that it 
travels, you get the wavelength. For example, the 400 terahertz frequency of light will have a single oscillation of 750 nanometers. And the energy of this 400 terahertz light will be 1.65 electron volts. Now we haven't talked about electron volts yet, but it is yet another way to describe a joule. I think this way of describing the photon energy became popular when the experimentalists were testing the photoelectric effect. Let's try a calculation to see if we can learn anything more about H. I'm going to type in two electron volts. So this is the energy of a photon of red light. Two electron volts is equal to this many joules. It also matches with the 484 terahertz, and it also matches for the 620 nanometer wavelength for red light. So what I want to know is the average energy per oscillation for this many joules, which is equivalent to two electron volts. So we know that there's 484 trillion oscillations in this frequency of red light. So I am going to divide the total energy of this photon by 484 trillion and I'm going to put the label of cycles here. So we have the total photon energy in joules. We have 484 trillion cycles so this should give us the average energy per cycle, or joules per cycle. And we get this number. That number is Planck's constant. 6.62 times 10 to the negative 34. The difference is we have the units of joule second. This is the way that physics describes this constant but I've shown we can look at it a different way. Planck's constant as joules per cycle. Now we're going to look at H as having the unit of a joule per oscillation instead of joule second. And we got here by using this equation. Remember we started with the photon energy of two electron volts then converted it to joules. Seeing H as a quantum of energy that happens per electromagnetic oscillation changes a lot of physics. For example, just by this definition, the wave and the particle are now combined. So let's take another look at this from a different angle. We know that this is a one second hard-coded equation that came from an experiment where the data was collected at one second intervals. So let's go ahead and input into this equation all of the one second time frames. We have Planck's constant as a joule. This second is an artifact from the black body radiation experiment. And then we'll put one electromagnetic cycle occurring in one second, or one hertz. Here's the one second. Here's the one electromagnetic cycle. Now we can cancel out the one seconds, but we're not going to destroy this information. So after plugging in everything that happens in one second into this equation, we are left with Planck's constant as energy, not as joule second, and one electromagnetic cycle. In other words, this is the energy of an electromagnetic cycle. Okay, so with H being the quantum of energy, we can now calculate that 
light has quantized mass and momentum. Wow, so this is interesting. So we know that the measurement unit for energy is a joule. And for H, it's also a joule, but per oscillation. And if we look at the joule in terms of base units, we get this. If you look up the base units, you might see it in this form. All I'm doing is writing it as meters per second times meters per second. Now we can plug back in the variables for these units. So for joule, it's E. For the base unit kilogram, we have mass. For the base unit of velocity, we plug in C, which is the symbol for the speed of light. And you combine this and you get the famous E equals mc squared without any complicated derivation. Now since E and H are both a joule, what we can do is plug in H, but remember it's per oscillation. And in this particular case, we're going to make that oscillation 1 hertz or 1 oscillation per second. And we're going to calculate the mass because we know the value of H and we know the value of C, or the speed of light. So we have H equals MC squared. We need to isolate the M, so we're going to divide both sides by C squared. Then we end up with mass equaling this term, and we can plug in the values here and get this value for the mass of a single oscillation of light. And we can see the calculation here. Planck's constant in joules, speed of light squared, and this is the mass related to a single oscillation of electromagnetic radiation. This is the quantum of mass, so no mass can be divided smaller than this. And having mass associated to light is a big deal, because now we can calculate the momentum. Let's walk through this one. So the symbol P is momentum. Momentum is a mass times a velocity. And you can see that right here. So we're going to isolate momentum in this equation. And we divide both sides by C. And now we can calculate this value. Here we have Planck's constant in joules over the speed of light. And this is the quantum of momentum. So in today's science, the photon is considered a massless particle. And the problem with that concept is in order to have momentum, you need to have mass. Momentum is a mass times a velocity. Now, I don't want to get too far into Einsteinian relativity here, but if you go study the problem of the massless photon, it is actually a paradox. That's because when you end up with E equals PC as the momentum of a massless photon, P still requires a mass by virtue of its definition. And if mass is zero, then P is zero. But anyway, when you see that H is joule per oscillation, or H is energy, then the math brings out the mass that is related to a single oscillation of light. The next topic is the idea of a high-energy photon. Currently in science, this exists. But in the unified view of light, all electromagnetic frequencies have the same energy per oscillation. 
So if you talk about something like X-rays, those are generally considered high energy photons, whereas radio waves are low energy photons. So let's see how that happens using this chart. We have the visible spectrum here, and we'll take red light, which is 400 terahertz, and it has 1.65 electron volts of photon energy. Now if we go up here to violet light or near ultraviolet light, we have almost double the frequency. And if you look at the energy, it's almost doubled. So this higher frequency light is considered a higher energy than this lower frequency light. So why does it work out this way? We know that the photon energy is calculated using this equation, but what science is asking us to do in this equation is to throw away the idea of time and space. In other words, disregard the one second that it takes to get these oscillations, and disregard the space that is occupied by these wavelengths in order to create the energy. We know that nature does not absorb and radiate energy in one second time frames. So this equation is being turned into an instant energy transformation. So the idea of high energy photons exists because when this number, the frequency, increases, so does the energy associated to the frequency. So just to relate this back to the photoelectric effect, as you increase the frequency of the light, the electrons on the surface of the metal are ejected faster and faster. This increasing photon energy was used to explain that effect. In other words, the instantaneous transformation of this into energy allows for the math to kind of mimic what was going on in the photoelectric experiment. In the unified view of light, each wavelength or each oscillation has the same H energy associated to it. So the question might be, how do we get high energy light with this type of viewpoint? And the short answer to that would be wave constructive interference or wave superposition. If you're measuring light energy per second, as in frequency, then you get exactly this per second. Because frequency increases oscillations per second or H energy per second. So if you're following all of this, you might describe HV as a one second ray of light with the minimum amplitude created by the quantum of energy. So how small is a quantum of energy? I don't know if we can really answer that, but we can give it a shot. So here's a list that compares the various energies in joules. So if we go to our macroscopic world, we can get an idea from this. Imagine if we took a cigarette lighter and heated up the thermometer by one degree Celsius. And if we go to 10 to the 34th order of magnitude, it's estimated that the total output of the sun for an entire year. So if we think of the energy of Planck's constant like a cigarette lighter that's on for a couple of seconds, then at our scale, we would be like our sun burning for an entire year in the solar system. I don't know how accurate that is, but it gives you an idea that the quantum of energy is very, very, very small. So then what is a photon? That's a really good question. There are single photon sources on the market and single photon detectors. Now that we know the E equals HV problem, 
and we know h as the quantum of energy, then I think we can ask better questions. Let's use green light as an example at 500 nanometers. We can type in 500 nanometer at the speed of light, and we get one femtosecond per oscillation of green light. And it looks like the femtosecond is one quadrillionth of a second. We have some type of timing control of laser pulses that will work at the femtosecond and attosecond time frames. And look, this is crazy fast. And realize that our gigahertz electronics is down in this range a billionth of a second. So this laser technology must be working almost twice as fast as our fastest electronics. Looking at the detector side, we can see that it's rated for 15 picoseconds. This is great technology, but it doesn't seem fast enough to be able to count individual green oscillations. And then the last part would be to figure out what is the minimal amount of energy that can be detected at that femto speed. And this would be a very difficult question to answer. Because we don't have specifications based on a per oscillation basis. Basically what it goes back to is what is a photon? And given the information about the quantum flaw, the definition of a photon is still an open question. Well, this video is getting close to an hour now, so I'm going to break this up into multiple parts. So for the final slide of this video, I'd like to acknowledge where I got my information on the quantum flaw and how you can go learn more about this in greater detail. I think we owe a debt of gratitude to Dr. Juliana Mortensen for putting together all of this information. She first published the quantum flaw information in 1999. So you have to imagine in the 90s to get access to a lot of these old books, you were using card catalogs, Dewey Decimal Systems, and trying to find books that probably weren't even on the shelf anymore. If you go to her website, ForgottenPhysics.com, she has published a lot of great scientific information and specifically the earliest reference that I've found on this issue. Let's take a quick look at this paper. On page 11, you'll find the first reference to the quantum flaw. In fact, this whole video is pretty much just a reteaching of what she found over 20 years ago. Lori Gardy has also published a lot of information on this subject. And this information was very instrumental for my own learning. You can go to her YouTube channel and view videos on this same subject that go into greater detail. She has also published a physics essay that fixes the problem in mathematics that we discussed early in this video. This essay also uses the Planck's constant as the quantum of energy and then recalibrates all of the Planck derived units. And I'd like to point out something in this paper that I find very fascinating. One of the derived Planck units is the lowest temperature that we could ever achieve. In other words, the real absolute zero. By seeing H as the quantum of energy instead of the quantum of action, she has found that we cannot go below this temperature because that would correspond to an energy that is less than the quantum of energy H. I think if the cold temperature physicist would know this, then the cold atom laboratory that we have in the International Space Station would probably be trying to hit this temperature. This would experimentally prove that if we cannot go below this temperature, then H is in fact the quantum of energy. We would effectively be reaching the bottom of our universe. Then it would be a very hard argument to say that H is just some kind of a mathematical trick. Well, I hope this gives you an awareness of the quantum flaw. And in the next video, we will look at how this applies to the rest of quantum physics.